today's topic is uh, measuring your impact and the many different ways we um, can examine where our research goes and how we can one better understand um, who's reading it and impacted by it and also learn about the many new metrics and ways of um, expanding the scope of your work so let's see it's four o'clock uh, we'll go ahead and get started so my name is Girija Kaimo I'm an associate professor in the creative arts therapies department and um, I will be moderating the session today and also sharing some of my experiences with me are uh, Dr. Jonathan Deutsch, uh, Roseanne Di Maria Galili, Annie Kaur, and Janice Masood Paul. So, how about um, each of you just do a quick intro and then dive into our slides? Sure. Uh, I guess we'll go in, in order. I'm uh, John Deutsch. I'm a professor in the Department of Food and Hospitality Management now in CNHP and uh, director of the Drexel Food Lab. Hi everyone, I'm Roseanne Di Maria Galili. I'm professor of nursing and also an associate dean. Welcome. Hi everyone, I'm Annie Kerf. I'm the news manager for science and nursing in the Office of University Communications and um, Media Relations for CNHP, as well as um, a few of the programs in College of Arts and Sciences, the Autism Institute, and Sport Business in uh, Lebeau. Thank you. Hello, I'm Janice Masood Paul. I'm the Librarian for Health Sciences Research and I support the College of Nursing and Health Professions. All right. Okay, so thanks everyone. I see folks are still joining in. Um, but we can go ahead and get started. We have uh, slides from each of our panelists and then we um, hope to finish by about, um, let's see. 445 ish and we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A. If you'd like to uh, add your questions in the chat box, please go ahead and do so. And then we'll try and address them right at the end. All right. So maybe we can get started now, Janice. Would you okay. Like and I am going to stop my video. Okay, so you all are probably most familiar with uh, bibliometrics categories that focus on publication citations. Uh, alt metrics are newer metrics that are used for a variety of internet formats like blogs or social media. The journal impact factor may be one of the most well-known bibliometric measures. Uh, the impact factor is the average number of citations to those papers that were published during the preceding two years. This is an example of how the journal impact factor for 2020 would be calculated, although it probably wouldn't be available before 2021. I think they're actually showing 2019 impact factors now. In theory, articles that are appearing in journals that are highly cited are seen by more readers and researchers. So if you have your work in a journal with a high impact factor, this could mean that your work is well disseminated. Now, there are other journal metrics and some of these try to make up for deficiencies in the journal impact factor. Uh, there's acceptance rates, and that's the total number of articles accepted out of the total number of articles submitted in a calendar year. Sometimes that denominator is a little bit different. It could be the total number that are reviewed. And then there's the Egen factor. That's the number of times in the past five years a journal's articles have been cited in the journal citation report. That's a web of science uh, publication or tool. So it only contains journals that are indexed in the web of science database. The Samago journal rank also called the SJR is a Scopus tool. It weighs journals based on their quality and reputation. It tries to account for differences across disciplines. 
you can also filter journals by region or open source in the SJR. And I think you can do that in um, uh, the journal citation reports as well. And finally, there's the Google Scholar metrics. That includes two different types of views. So you can look at the top 100 publications or you can view a broad list of subjects and you can break those down into subcategories. That runs on a rolling five-year basis. So I believe that currently it's including articles published between 2015 and 2019 with citations from June of 2020. We started off with metrics for journals, but there are also metrics for authors or scholars. Probably the one you're most familiar with is the Hirsch index or the H index and some of its variations. Now, H indexes are designed to improve upon simpler measures of metrics like counting an author's total number of publications or the total number of citations. But it combines an assessment of both the quantity, the number of papers, and an approximation of the quality, the number of citations to those papers. To calculate your H index, you look at the number of papers that you've published and see how often they were cited. So this is the formula for calculating your index. And for some reason, every time I view that, my brain just sort of freezes. So I'm much better off with a little graphic. In this particular case, we have a scholar with an H index of eight. They have 12 articles, but at least eight of their pa papers have been published, or excuse me, have been cited eight times each in the remaining papers eight times or less. So they have an H index of eight. You wanna keep in mind that your H index can't be higher than your total number of publications and that you should only compare H indexes within a discipline. There's a lot of variations in the dissemination of information among different disciplines. In some cases, dis more disciplines are using, let's say books or conference proceedings. And so journal citations aren't going to be counted. So you wanna only compare each indexes within a discipline. And even within a discipline, you wanna only compare H indexes using the same H index tool because there's a lot of variation between let's say Google Scholar's calculation of the H index and Web of Science. Now, all metrics are used to capture impact beyond traditional journals. They include things like data repositories, web page views, uh, Mendeley downloads, and so on. Uh, bibliometrics and alt metrics, though, can complement each other. Alt metrics are really good for highlighting your current contributions. It can seem like it takes forever to publish in a peer reviewed journal. And then it takes additional time for those indexing agencies to calculate your citation oh. metrics. But things like your downloads of your paper or your data set or mentions of a television appearance or presentations are more immediate ways to highlight your contributions. And it allows you to showcase different types of work. There are a number of sources that measure alt metrics. A lot of them are open source. Um, if you have a favorite alt metric tool you're not seeing on the slide, please feel free to share that in the chat so we could share it with others. But I found that some of the open source versions of alt metric tools kind of come and go. So in this slide, I tried to include some that seem to be a little bit more stable and are popular, although most of these have some fee associated with it. They do have some free tools or you would have access to them as members of the Drexel community because they may be databases that Drexel subscribes to. So I'm sure you're familiar with this Altmetric donut, um, Altmetric the company. 
And the donut visualizes how much and which type of attention each research output is, uh, receives. Each color in the donut and the amount of color tells you the source of data on the research output. So for example, I believe dark red are more traditional news outlets. Green represents video updates. Yellow represents blogs and so on. The number that's in the middle of the donut is the attention score. And this, is, this isn't just a, a number of hits. It's actually a weighted metric. It includes things like volume, so that's related to the number of hits, but it also includes information about the source of information. So, for example, those traditional news outlets that I mentioned earlier, they get a certain number of points, uh, blogs get a certain number of points, and all of that is averaged in with other elements to create the attention score. Altmetric bookmarklet is actually one of the tools in Altmetrics that's free. And apparently you can upload that bookmarklet in order to get Altmetric information on literature and other publications. I'm pretty sure that that works with Chrome and Safari, not so sure about uh, Firefox. Plum Analytics is a competitor to Altmetric. And it collects metrics in five categories, uh, including usage, captures, social media, citations, and mentions. So if you've used the EBSCO version of CINAHL, and considering this is CNHP, many of you probably have, you've probably seen the plum graphics at the bottom of certain citations. Unfortunately, they ended their relationship with EBSCO towards the end of 2020, but they still have historical information. So I think they began to collect it from about 2015 through 2020. And that information is still included for citations that have PlumEx. You can get more current information from what I understand from Elsevier databases like Scopus, Clinical Key, and Science Direct, although Honestly, I still have not seen that PlumEx analytics sign at the bottom of their citation. So I'm looking into that to see why it's not showing up. Impact Story is, I think, a more recent tool. I know it recently changed its name, but it measures traditional citation information, but also metrics like the number of online mentions, um, the number of saves, and it has a couple of different types of metrics like the level of global outreach. It also gives you recognition as what they call an open hero if you make items available through open access. So there are a number of caveats and considerations, uh, limitations of some of these tools, and it would probably take the rest of uh, this presentation time in order to go over all of them, but I'll just mention a couple. In terms of alt metrics, again, it hasn't been qu around quite as long as bibliometrics. So it's really important to include the context of the metric when you're telling your impact story not just the number of hits, but you wanna know where those hits occurred and why, that's very important. It can also be somewhat unclear um, exactly how the sources are being weighted. It's not always transparent. And attention for altmetrics doesn't necessarily equal influence. So, you know, you can get a number of tweets about your article. It's hard to know what type of impact that might have for some time. In terms of journal metrics, one of the major issues is that impact factors can really undervalue smaller specialized journals or smaller disciplines. So that's something that you wanna keep in mind and consider other ways of measuring your impact, even if you're using bibliometric tools like acceptance rates. But sometimes acceptance rates can be hard to find. Um, you can Google that information, Often you can, well, I shouldn't say often, sometimes you can find it out from the editor or the publisher and it can be associated with different societies, but it's not the same place for every discipline.
For H indexes, they include the number of articles cited, and that minimizes the effect of having one or two highly cited articles in your portfolio. In some ways, that's by design, but if you happen to be one of those authors that only have a few articles and they were highly cited, you want to you may want to use a different version or a variation in the H index. I believe that the G index variant will recognize highly cited, uh, highly cited articles. You want to remember that different bibliometric tools source different journals. So when you're looking at impact factors, look at more than one tool. You know, look at look at uh, Web of Sciences tool, as well as Scopus and Google Scholar. Both bibliometric and altmetric resources are really just tools in your toolbox. So they shouldn't be the only ways that you're measuring your impact or your engagement. So I'm going to turn this over to my colleagues. They'll tell you more about other ways of measuring your impact and how to create a measurable impact. Thank you, Janice. Um, and if, if uh, you know, if you're joining us a little bit later, we we do want to highlight a lot of what we'll be talking about today is uh, peer-reviewed research. So um, the metrics really uh, depend on your discipline, and none of this is sort of you know across the board. Different disciplines value different metrics. And for example, in my uh, discipline, our, our main journal does not have an impact factor. And that's because one of the challenges is that um, impact factor is highly dependent on citations. So if you're in a discipline where there isn't a large uh, um, an active research body, things would vary. Also, the I, I was uh, fascinated to learn that the H index varies. So on Google Scholar, it includes book chapters, for example. Uh, but I don't believe the um, other um, H index does. But again, lots of things to consider. A lot of these things are very subjective, um, but this is really, uh, we hope, useful information. So next up, we have Dr. Uh, Rosandi Maria Galili talking with us about Publons. Well, thank you, everyone. And, and I would definitely agree that H index is not the be all and end all. And it's just uh, one way of measuring impact uh, and to tell your story. And I think that's the most important part of it. I know for my H index, Google Scholar captures much more of the, the articles that uh, I've published than Web of Science. So, you know, that's really important when you look across uh, what's picking up uh, your publications. Uh, and just like creative arts therapy, most of the nursing journals have very low impact factors as well. So uh, not like the basic science. So um, it's also something to think about. Uh, it's very discipline specific, but I wanna share with you something new that's out there. Uh, and many of you who may, be, who may review journal articles might get this uh, email. Do you want to uh, sign up for Publons or do you wanna be credited in Publons? And so much of what we do as scholars is peer review, right? We peer, we were always asked to review manuscripts, grants, things of that nature. And, you know, we always put that in our portfolio and our self-avow at the end of the year, uh, how many articles we reviewed perhaps, but, you know, uh, there's no way to really track that. And Publons is one of the ways that you can actually track uh, the journals that you're reviewing for. So if you sign up for Publons, now we're all supposed to have an ORCID ID uh, or a researcher ID, and they're all uh, sort of linked together. But now if you actually um, have um, an ORC ID, you can get a, a Publons account. And when you review a journal article, if you know there are some of the big publishers, they will ask you, do you want to get credit <clears throat> for Publons? And if you say yes, then when you set up your dashboard, it will t what um, people will see uh, on, uh, it, on your profile is how many articles you reviewed for different journals. They won't say the journal, the, the titles of the journal of the articles you reviewed, because most of that is still um, peer reviewed and blinded. But it will say 
um, how many articles you reviewed. So that's also, I think, a good way if you want to keep track for your own sake, um, for your if you're going up for promotion and you want to show evidence that you've reviewed articles, you know, this could be a, an evolving way of keeping track of the articles that you're reviewing. So that's really all I have to say. You can go onto their website, find out more information, or any of the journals that you publish, uh, you do peer review for, um, they will all have information on their website. So. Thanks, Roseanne. This is really helpful. And I, this is new, right? That there's, I it's don't know new. any such thing, uh, recognition of reviewer. This is, I just thought of that as kind of service that goes into the ether. Right. And I think so much of what we do for service is this kind of scholarly work. And mm -hmm. I, I learned about it last year because I'm on an, a journal editorial board for a, a Wiley uh, journal. And I learned about it and I was like, wow, this is like really great because now, you know, you could start tracking, you know, your service. And I think that's great because we do so much. And um, it's a way of tracking. And on the uh, on the back end of this, what I've learned is um, the journal editors can now rank the reviewers. So every which is blinded again, you don't know what your score is, but based <laughs> on how fast you do your score, I know about that score. <laughs> I know. So uh, you know, big data is out there everywhere. They're tracking everything that we do. So I just thought that it would be nice to share this, and I'm still learning how to use it as well. But um, something else for your toolbox. That may be an example where a low rating is more desirable, so you get fewer requests. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I have a reviewer karma theory, which is that for every paper I put out, I promise to review something by someone else. So I feel like if I make that commitment to the universe, maybe the universe will bring me back my reviews on time. I think it should go the other way. Every paper you review, you should have an easy acceptance. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you set the bar higher, Jonathan. <laughs> oh, and I see Justine is here. We've had some interesting experiences with getting some articles published of late, uh, you know, so that's another story in itself. We could maybe chat about that later. Yeah, that's for the after party, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm passing the baton to Annie, I yeah. think is going next. Oh, no, it's me. Okay, so um, Annie, I guess Annie's after me, right? Okay, so I'll talk to you a little bit about my experiences with media outlets. And I have to say, I learned this the hard way. Um, so in 2015, we had this project with the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, and somehow Fox News got news of what we were doing. And they wanted to do like a TV special. And I had never done a TV thing before. They came to our offices, they recorded us. And I, I was so panic stricken by that whole experience. I couldn't sleep at night. I, I, and the thing with TV you should know is that they don't show you what they are going to show. So I had no idea what is going to show up on Fox News. And I thought, oh, my God, what if they say something strange? This is with the military. What if like the project blows up? What if I lose my job? You know, what if they put something embarrassing? So anyway, I worked myself into a tizzy. And <laughs> because I did that, the person in media communications at that time was Frank Otto. I don't know if some of you remember Frank Otto. He said, OK, you need to come down and you need to do a media training. So University Communications offered this media training, and that really, really helped me um, take ownership and kind of not be so freaked out every time there was a, a media interaction. So I'll share with you some of my lessons learned from that. And we can go to the next, um, next slide. Okay, so these are some of the outlets that I have communicated some of my research with. And I have to say, this is not necessarily something that helps you in, you know, getting grants or funding or anything like that. That still goes through a really rigorous peer review. But what this does is generates awareness. So I, for example, I'm in a discipline that uh, is not very well known. So when I when I get requests for media, I always say yes, because it's an opportunity to uh, advance awareness of my discipline and what I do. 
and to clear you know misrepresentations and you know if you don't do it someone else will do it and they may or may not represent it accurately so i really think of this as service uh, to to the work that i do and first um, if it's not so when requests come to you it's a combination of a response to a press release or they might have read something or it might be that you know the time is ripe for this news. So for example, when COVID hit and people were at home and there was a lot of reflection on creative work, there were media questions like, what should you do to manage your mood and manage yourself at home? So I spoke a lot about um, creative activities, things you can do to kind of self-regulate and manage yourself. Uh, sometimes requests might be from people you don't know. So I always run it by uh, Annie and say, is this legit? And, uh, you know, she'll confirm for me or she'll be like, eh, maybe not. And the, the best part about Annie, as you'll discover, she'll say, you know what, I'll handle the no for you, which is, um, which is actually really fantastic. So if it's a known source, um, I, I make myself available. And sometimes people ask questions via email or they want a quick phone conversation. It's usually pretty quick. And the number one thing I learned from that media training is that you have agency so always have like two or three key points in mind so don't just react to the reporter's questions make sure your message is clear in your mind so even if they're asking oh what is the purpose of blah 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 you respond but make sure you embed your response as well so in my case my standard embedded response is yeah art making is great but if you need professional help you should go to an art therapist it's not the same thing so that's a message that I always embed in there. I also embed a link to my professional association. If you want more information, go to blah, blah, blah. So keep in mind that you can actually control the conversation a lot more than you realize. Okay? Uh, then you are the expert. You know this topic better than anyone else. So remember that. And one thing that we don't always do well is uh, we get caught up in minutiae so if you're a researcher you're like yeah these were my findings but you know these are the limitations and in this context really you can only generalize to this and that nobody's interested in that okay you people don't understand the nuances so you want to be really careful about what message you want to put out there and what can you truly confidently say about your findings okay and Make sure you say it in a sort of a language that a lay person will understand, no jargon. Um, and in all of this, I consult regularly with university communications. So Annie has done several press releases for us. And usually we've done that as a combination. So if we've done a paper that we're really proud of and excited by, we'll share it with university communications and they put together a press release and only university communications can do that put out a press release to the public. And uh, I work very closely with her and uh, she's been an amazing ally. So thank you for that. Along with um, CNHP Marketing, which does a lot of um, uh, outreach and pub uh, publicity for the press releases um, on Twitter, on Instagram, on all those places. And lastly, um, remember that norms vary by media. So some places will show you a copy, print especially, might show you a copy of what they are going to write. Um, the more reputable sources will show you, but most do not. So when we did a special with NPR, um, I just kind of trusted that it will come out. Um, she gave me a sense of what would be there, but she didn't show me the actual uh, piece. TV, I, it's just, you just hope. And that Fox News thing worked out, but you know, you just hope whatever's uh, coming out is what you would like emphasized and this is where again make sure you reiterate your main message and uh, print again it varies it varies in terms of what is included and not i also you know on my twitter account facebook less so but linkedin and twitter i will share the press releases that come through um, or publications I'll tag people that are connected. And um, similarly, I'll you know promote others who are in the college, uh, in the university who are doing similar research. So um, all this is sort of service, right? Advancing your profession as well as advancing the work of your colleagues. Yeah. All right, so next up would be Annie. 
Uh, great. Uh, that was a great um, follow. You know, thank you for your kind words. And also, um, I think you are a testament to our media training. So if anyone is interested, please reach out to me. We are still offering it. Um, we did drop off a little bit, obviously, because of COVID, but we are bringing it back virtually. Um, so if you are interested, Grisha just gave a great uh, testimony for it. And I thank you for that. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm the news manager for science and nursing, as well as working with the College of Nursing and Health Professions, faculty members. Um, I also work with psychology, physics, chemistry, math in College of Arts and Sciences, the AJ Drexel Austin Institute and Sport Business in Lebeau College of Business. Um, now, everything I have on these two slides is also available a little bit more in depth on our media relations best practices in the University Communications website. I can drop that link in the chat for anyone who um, is interested in reading more there. So I'm a news manager um, that I work with media relations. Um, it depends, you know, that's our title here at Drexel. It could be different at other institutions, but basically what it is that I do is helping promote the faculty that I work with. Um, I do that by building relationships with journalists um, and you know, reaching out to them and answering their questions. Um, if they're looking for experts commentary, I help them connect it. So you know, try to build a, a two-way street. Not only are they reaching out to me, but I'm also reaching out to them with newsworthy um, information. Um, we are, again, I, I'm here to publicize your research findings. So if you're published and you have results from your, your research um, that, are, that will make an impact in people's lives, we wanna talk about it. And um, so that's what I'm here to do. I respond to requests for expert commentary. So if you know, there's something happening in current events and a journalist reach out, they're looking for somebody to talk about X, Y, Z. Hopefully I have a faculty member that can connect them. Um, you know, it's a great opportunity. Obviously Philadelphia area is flush with universities. So there are experts from all over, but we hope that they're gonna to come to Drexel first and we'll be able to connect them with a faculty member from Drexel. Um, also helping to place opinion essays, op-eds um, and assist with writing or editing as you would need. So how do I do this? Um, we, as Grija mentioned, we do news releases for published research, which is just like a summary of the news event that we're trying to talk about. We also do targeted media pitches. Um, so if you have a story idea of something you wanna talk about, whether it's your research, your expertise, um, we'll write that to one or two highly engaged journalists that would be interested in that story idea. Um, media advisories are similar to news releases, a uh, little bit more condensed, the you know, basic who, what, where, when, and why of an, typically of an event or other news um, topic. Expert tips, as I mentioned, you know, if you are, if there's a faculty member that has um, expertise, can comment on something that's happening in the news, uh, we'll reach out to journalists to let them know, you know, the expert is here at Drexel and they're available to talk to you as well as owned media. Um, in this case, it's the Drexel News blog, um, which is not to be confused with the Drexel Now publications. Um, we have, our, our blog is Google News Indexed, um, which helps with SEO. So if there is a topic that you wanna discuss, um, you know, if we write this blog and tag you in it and tag the information that you wanna talk about, um, if a, a journalist searches for a certain topic, it'll come up in Google News Searches. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this is all on the media relations best practices. Um, Janice, can you move to the next slide? Thank you. So kind of along the lines of what Grigio was saying, you know, why would you wanna to speak to media about either your expertise or your research that's been published? Um, it informs others, it can inspire others, it can help you recruit participants into future studies, um, especially if you know, you're published on something that you know you'll be doing further further uh, research on, you can help you, it can help you to uh, recruit participants for that. It can also help you, you know, enhance your career prospects or, and or secure future funding. Um, you know, kind of what Karija said, this isn't definite, but it helps, you know, on your CV, it helps um, when you talk about how it is that you guys are going to promote the research that you're doing. Um, and it can also help you make connections with potential collaborators. The more eyes that you get on this research, the more potential um, people are interested in it that would like to work with you. And to set yourself up for success, other so to go along with some of the things that Karija mentioned, 
Um, know what makes something newsworthy. If you're unsure, that's um, the resource to be here to help you decide if it is or if it's not. Um, to make yourself accessible and available, especially if you know that you know we have a news release going out, it's a great time for you to make sure that you're available to speak with media. Obviously, you know not all opportunities you're going to be able to make, um, but the more that you can, the better. Um, if you keep having to turn down opportunities, unfortunately, the opportunities aren't going to continue to happen. Um, you know, stay current with news and trends that are happening in your field or current events and that you can do that by writing op-eds. Um, as Grisha mentioned, the media training, which we are again offering virtually. Um, so if you are interested, um, reach out. You know, set expectations for yourself, but don't be discouraged. Not every opportunity is going to land. Not every interview is going to turn into a published um, article or television appearance, but don't be discouraged by that. Um, news happens. Uh, you know, there's news breaks that might have bumped the story that was supposed to run tonight. So don't be discouraged if it doesn't always happen. There's going to be opportunities. And, um, you know, if you have your media training, like Ray just said, you'll get those opportunities and you'll get, you know, those hits in print or on TV or on the radio. Um, and then work with the communications office. If you, you know, my contact information is there. If you're interested in in media opportunities, please reach out to me. If you forget my information there, um, please reach out to Roberta Perry from CNHP's communications office and she will gladly um, connect you with me. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Annie, and thank you for all you do. And um, I have to, I, I, I think I appreciate you saying the don't be discouraged piece because sometimes, you know, you say things and then the what actually shows up is, you know, one fifth and then you're like, oh, you know. <laughs> I don't know if that's what I really meant, but um, unless there's an error, so sometimes I've reached out and said, you know, that's actually wrong, please fix that, um, or like typos, nobody ever gets my name right, so that's, that's something I'll always reach out to <laughs> yeah. um, But that's mostly a... just accept that it's go not going to be as nuanced and beautiful as you would like it to be. <laughs> yes. That's a good point though. If there's anything, if there are opportunities that you have had and you know you noticed an error of something that they misquoted you or they spelled something wrong or it just wasn't correct, reach out to me because they will they typically respond to requests for updates or corrections. Um, but like you said, they're not always going to be forthcoming with after the interview. Mm -hmm. Like Rita said, you know, know that you are the expert. If you talk to them and you feel that maybe there was something that they didn't understand, you can always go back to them and say, here's more information. Um, maybe, you know, here's something that just in case you weren't sure, I have more information on this. Um, they appreciate that because again, you are the expert. So be confident in what you're um, speaking about. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for all your support for um, our work. All right, so uh, next we have Jonathan. Great, thanks. Um, thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, before I start, I want to put in a plug for working with Annie. Um, people know I'm kind of cranky sometimes about uh, people, but I th those who I love working with, I stand by uh, loving to work with. So Annie's been, been great um, for our work as well. Um, and um, I think I was asked to be on this panel um, because a lot of our work is very applied. So um, doesn't mean it's not peer reviewed, um, which I have to remind people sometimes it's real scholarship, but um, a lot of our work is applied sort of industry and association facing that that is focused on um, improving practice. And, and to me, that's, that's um, the real impact, I know it's easy to say as someone who's been through the tenure process as opposed to someone who's starting on the tenure process or, but um, you know, um, I come out of hospitality management, which is a field that um, people are not exactly uh, citing the latest hospitality industry research on, on your, you know, evening commute or um, you know that kind of stuff, but where um, where it impacts your experience, obviously that's that's really important. And in in food, where I do most of my work, um, 
it's a it's a universal and a very pressing thing. We have a very fragile food system that's at risk of not being able to support our future generations. And so, you know, we can talk about impact in terms of uh, impact factor, and and I certainly know how to play that game. But um, and I've done it, and it's not to minimize it. But there's also the impact factor of like, can we can we do something to make sure our great grandkids can eat? Uh, and so you know, it's it's um, becomes a little existential. So anyway, I'll I'll tell some stories real quickly, and then I, I know we're anxious to get to Q and A. So can you go to the next slide, please, Janice? So um, the first thing you know, when I started at Drexel in in 2013, and and still continuing through today, I get a lot of people who say. Um, oh, I didn't even know Drexel had food or culinary or hospitality. I think of it as an engineering school, which I know makes the health professions and, and nursing folks crazy. Uh, I think of it for engineering or business uh, or health, you know, uh, back when there was Hahnemann, maybe you would hear that. Um, so, um, and, and I was really brought in, um, I'm a Drexel alum, and worked at, at City University of New York for 12 years um, prior to coming to Drexel. And, and Mark Greenberg, uh, who was the provost at the time, um, reached out really to say, here, here we are with this research university trying, at the time, trying to get to a Carnegie R1. Um, and what does it mean to have culinary and what does that look like? And how do you do, is there such a thing as culinary research and how do you do that? And um, so one of the first things we did was was really branded this lab, um, and and it's totally off the grid. I think um, you know there's a whole process for becoming a center or an institute or or you know having a interprofessional research uh, endeavor, but there's nothing preventing anyone from kind of defining their research and and their work in in hopefully a way that's. Uh, that's effective. The other thing from a media relations standpoint, so my name is Deutsch. So the Deutsch lab is okay, you know, as a sort of catch all, but it's not okay when it's mispronounced in the in the media. So I, um, I try to, um, so we call it the Drexel Food Lab and, and it in, engages other faculty as well. And the, um, I think the most important thing in, in having impact and building that awareness is um, being able to succinctly explain what we do, you know, I, when I started in, in my career, I was, you know, I could do this grant, I could do that grant, I could apply for that, you know, but if you can sort of brand your, your niche and ours is in, in four words, good food product development, um, it really explains uh, a host of stuff, um, but in a, in a very clear and searchable way. Um, so that when you're talking with funders or you're talking to prospective students or you're talking to anyone, the media, they understand what you do. Because when you start to say, well, let me tell you about the food system and this theory and that theory, you, you've already lost them, right? So, um, so um, you, you'll see, and there's a link there, um, which I could put in the chat, to our, our media kit. This is another great resource in terms of impact. Um, where um, this is a Drexel tool. This is on the grid, believe it or not, um, where um, everyone uh, can get a sway through Office 365 and you can put up um, your articles and press clips and sort of whatever you want to show the world. And it's, it's a lot more effective than um, having to have a presentation with someone to explain who you are and what you do. Uh, you could put it in your email signature, which I don't, um, but uh, you could send it to people if they, if they want to talk more or something like that. So that's, that's a sort of easy shorthand trick. Can you go to the next slide? Great. So um, the other thing that I've tried to be very strategic about is um, in terms of having impact and measuring our impact is to take opportunities not to do work for its own sake, but to do work to further someone or something uh, that's important. And so uh, an example is um, I had a Pinoni custom design major student a couple of years ago named Olivia Spratt, who was very talented. 
and had to do, you know, in her words, I have to do a senior project. And, and so um, maybe a better or maybe a more authentic or, or uh, better pedagogically uh, way would be to say, um, well, what interests you, what excites you, what are your passions, what do you want to pursue, where are you intellectually curious? Um, but from a pragmatic standpoint, you know, I am on the board of a, a group called the Upcycled Food Association. And one of our, um, um, it was a new organization. One of our um, initiatives and priorities uh, last year was uh, we, while we need an agreed upon definition of what upcycled food even is, and that will lead to a certification program and so on. And so, um, Olivia was um, pitched by me this idea of, well, since you are interested in food and need the senior project, what if you do this uh, Adelphi study, which I, I won't get into, uh, but it's a, it's a method for exploratory research and you can do this as a senior project. Uh, and she was, she was taken with it uh, and she did it and it's published and peer reviewed. And I'm, I'm afraid to even ask Janice, what the impact factor of the Journal of Culinary Science and Technology is, um, but I'm sure it will not knock all, anyone's socks off, but it's an undergrad paper, right? Um, and so, you know, doing this kind of impactful work, I think does a lot, right? We have an undergrad published, which, uh, you know, Pannoni made a big deal about in their, in their magazine and so on. Um, we attracted some private foundation dollars um, supporting our work into sustainable food. Um, the industry association then put out their press release, uh, which we ran by Annie because we're good soldiers um, and made her happy. Um, there's uh, now an upcycled food certification being launched that's based on the work of a Drexel undergraduate in part, right? Um, further research going on. And um, most importantly to me, the student um, had direct contact with a bunch of members of this association who are all employers. And so, you know, you're building relationships in a very applied way, which um, is ultimately why we're all here. You can't have the university research endeavor without the students uh, supporting it. Right. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so the, the last thing I'll say uh, is one of the challenges we've had in terms of having impact and measuring the impact and, and also why it's great, you know, to, to work with, with creative colleagues is um, some of the frustration you have in getting people to see your work and acknowledge your work and have it resonate with the media is because um, our work is not that interesting and exciting unless it's explained in an interesting and exciting way. So I'll give you an example. The example on the left is um, we had a paper published in also in the Journal of Culinary Science and Technology um, about a CDC grant we have called the Sodium Reduction and Communities Program and some work we did with a bread company to reduce sodium, which sounds totally boring and it you know, it is. Um, but the image there is a pallet of 1300 pounds of salt that our program officer whose partner happens to work for a food company uh, took. And that is the amount of salt we took out of the Philadelphia school lunch program by doing this work, right? So like that is a cool story, but the first part was not a cool story. So um, a lot of what I've been learning has and, and you know and thanks to everyone uh, in this on this panel and especially Annie is like how to tell those stories in a way that allow for that impact other than saying well you know we did a 36 percent sodium reduction and 80 percent of the consumers could not detect it. like that doesn't ma mean anything to anyone uh and so the and the um, anti-inflammatory family cookbook is a cookbook that just came out um together with uh, Maria Mascarenas at CHOP and some uh, other collaborators, um, Ali Zeitz Romy, who uh, was our food lab manager and, and another chef and Hilly, Hillary uh, Cafferty, who's at University of Arizona. And that's the same thing, you know, um, I, I'm sure everyone on this call uh, has heard of anti-inflammatory cooking, has heard of the Mediterranean diet. You know, to me, it's like, 
that's that's like when my doctor says you should get 60 minutes of exercise a day and you say yeah yeah, yeah okay uh it's very different from having a tool to actually kind of make that happen you know for your family and translating that to practice so that's where we we uh it's not to uh minimize the importance of of peer-reviewed academic work because that underscores all of it but just to say you know in my mind that's that's only the beginning that's the evidence base for trying to translate that to a, a story that people will use so i will stop there all right thank you so much um uh, jonathan and thank you janice for um managing all our slides for us and really uh, managing our whole presentation today so um that was an amazing story about the salt it's like imprinted in my mind now um if we have any questions now would be a good time uh we have about 10 minutes if anyone wants to um bring up anything about the metrics or media relations and roberta saying kids hate anti-inflammatory food so this is a great thing to have surely Would you mind if I just said a couple of things? Yeah, go for it. So um, one of the other things that is available to you for pushing out your stuff is our own website. So I do work on articles for people about the work that they're doing or presentations that they're making or research that they're doing. So sometimes when Annie isn't able to get something you know, pushed out. It's not, you know, there's just no way to tell that story that would be super appealing to somebody in the media. You know, we can always come back and post it on our website. So, you know, I am working on a content strategy. So if, when there are things that I learn about, you know, and those things can't get, you know, they're, they're just, you know, there's just no way to do it with Annie, then, you know, that's something that we can do. And the other thing I'll mention is, um, we have a really robust and very uh, much growing um, social media uh, platforms. So, you know, JM is doing a fantastic job with pushing out some really great stuff. So that's the other thing I would request is that, you know, in addition to sending any things that you also, you know, include us because we might be able to push something out on social media that Annie may or may not be able to do. So that's, um, you know, that's a, that's a, that makes our life easier. And especially because we want to be putting out there really great content that is relevant and that is going to bring people back to CNHP. Uh, and so when we do that, we also highlight you guys as the, the experts. And, you know, if you happen to be on social media, we'll tag you. Like Garija says, you know, so she can tag other people and it just keeps, it, it gets longer legs. And that's one of the things that's really helpful for the CNHP website. Oh, great points, Roberta. And I know you do, I know I try to always CC um, both of you on some of, you know, some things are more appropriate at the college level and some things are more appropriate sort of outward looking. And you've done an amazing job. The Valentine's piece was really well done, by the way, <laughs> where you represented all the departments. Um, and absolutely right. You've included things on the CNHP council, staff council. You've included things on Daily Dose, um, our own newsletters, and um, website news sites. So absolutely. Thanks for reminding us of that and a great resource. Okay, so there's a question here from a doctoral student. Are these resources only ap applicable to faculty or is there ever an appropriate time for a PhD level student to partner with media relations after approval from their advisor? Um, so I can take that. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually very relevant. Um, I work, like, as I mentioned, I work with College of Arts and Sciences with the uh, psychology department, specifically the Well Center. Um, and they all oftentimes have the lead author as a PhD student. Um, if we are talking about published research and the lead author is a PhD student, I'm happy to work with you and help you with media relations, um, things like that. If it's something other than that, it might be a case by case basis, but we do work with students in media relations as well. 
Right, and student work is also profiled in the daily dose. Um, so we try and push as much as we can to uh, Roberta as well. Um, so not just, yeah, great point about the first author piece. And yeah, always go through your advisor because again, nobody wants to be surprised and mm -hmm. but we always want to be, <laughs> always want to be supportive and absolutely um, encourage and um, showcase our students. All right, uh, anything else? I did want to highlight one example. We recently had a press release done by an industry partner, and uh, this was with Johns Hopkins, the industry partner, and us. And we learned, so Johns Hopkins declined to be part of that press release, and then we learned that we also um, wouldn't uh, because it was a for-profit uh, industry partner. So again, you know, I went back to Annie, she checked as well, and we decided to pull out of like specific mention or actively being involved in that. And those are things you have to weigh. So as a, um, you know, private but nonprofit institution, we, we have to be careful. And I defer to our uh, internal and university uh, communications folks on what is the right call on some of these things. Appreciate you mentioning that, Rija. And as you mentioned earlier, if there's ever an opportunity that you're just not sure of, um, please feel free to reach out to me. You know, I can help you vet it. And if it's something that you're not comfortable with, I have no problem being the bad guy and saying, unfortunately, they're not available. And you know, just trying to defer and take you out of that situation. So that's what I'm here for. You know, always reach out to me. I I will never turn you away. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else? Anything anyone wants to add are from our panel? Lingering thoughts? I learned a lot today, I have to say. I did too, and thank you. I, I think, you know, the bibliometrics is the easy part, but it's the, it's the media and how to translate your work, which is really the hard part. So I learned a lot. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time. Let's give it up to our great panel. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Garisha and Annie and Jonathan and Roseanne and Janice. Uh, really, uh, and Roberta. Great. <laughs> and Darren. Thanks, Darren. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll uh, see you guys uh, next week at uh, Tuesday Topics. I hope you join us again. Thanks. <laughs>